Bye, completely fate. So, you all know I'm a lawyer. I work with the World Psych Organization of Canada. So I'm not here as necessarily a subject expert on 1984 that I've done a PhD on it or something like this. I'm here as someone that probably has thought about it quite a bit and has read about it. So whatever I tell you, don't take it for the gospel truth. It's just my understanding, my uh, interpretation. But for me, what's important about 1984 is to get a deeper understanding of what happened, why it happened. Because when we look at something as you know, heroes and villains, as dichotomies, we don't really have a true understanding. Right? And often our understanding of 1984 is Indra Gandhi bad, Sanjana Singh Singh's good, conflict, and you know, stuff happened. And that's really, uh, it's too simplistic, I think. Why were six targeted? Why have always six been targeted? Why is this conflict that's existed from the start uh, of our month to where we are today? Why? Right? So, to understand that, we can't jump right into 1984. Uh, and once again, like yesterday's talk, almost every single slide that I'm going to go into is a lecture in itself. So why do I do it this way? It's just to open your mind to all the different uh, angles. And then if you want, if you're interested, to go look into it yourselves and to do your own research. OK. So why? Why is this conflict? between state, the state and the six, whether it's the Mughal state, whether it's the Afghans, whether it's the British, whether it's uh, now present day India. Why is there this conflict? The answer is that Sikhi is a revolution. Sikhi challenges not just one level, it challenges every level of your existence. It challenges religious, it challenges cultural, it ch challenges political, challenges social. It's trying to change the way these established systems have worked and turn them on their head. And I know, I know Maninder Singh in his talk yesterday touched on it. Um, so I'm not uh, going to go too much into it. But in India, you had thousands of years of essentially this system that broke society down and created client and patron relationships. It had the Brahmins at the top who are a small minority who are by default controlling, manipulating, exploiting everyone at the bottom like a triangle, right? And based on what? Based on their birth. And Guru Nanak, he challenged that. He said no one is good or bad or anything by default of their birth that if you Brahman were born higher than me, then why weren't you born a different way? I was born the same way, you were born the same way, why didn't you come in a different way if you were better than me? So you don't have a limited sphere of opposition, you have opposition from every single angle. Like the Muslims aren't happy with it, the Hindus aren't happy with it, the caste uh, area is not happy with it, Culturally, people aren't liking it because this idea of emancipating women, it's revolutionary. All of it is revolutionary. And then we have to think about this concept of Sikh nationalism. I'll argue that nationalism, as we understand it today, is actually impossible to reconcile with Sikhi. So any sort of preference or any sort of... Uh, I guess, being higher because of your birth, whether that's because you were born in a, a religion, because you were born in uh, a particular uh, social uh, area, or because you were born in a certain country, Guru Nanak rejects it. So any inherent privilege that you, ha you think you have, inherent privilege. Guru Nanak is saying you don't have any inherent privilege. That you are the content, content of your character. There's no inherent privilege that anyone is born with. You make who you are. Everyone is born equal. So this, the extent of Guru Nanak's revolution is not Punjab. It's not even India. It's the world. And I think we have Guru Nanak as probably the only faith 
founder, you can say, the only Satguru who uh, traveled so extensively. And the only meaning we can take from that is, Sikhi is not a localized revolution. It is everywhere. We challenge everything and we challenge it everywhere. And for this reason, the establishment has always felt uncomfortable with Sikh values, has always challenged Sikh values as saying, we won't let you mess up what we have. And Guru Nanak is referred to as Jagat Guru by, uh, by Gurdas, Zahar Peer Jagat Guru Baba, that he is the Baba of the entire world. So taking this client-patron relationship that uh, almost the vast majority of people had, Guru Nanak said, you are sovereign, that you don't have anyone above you except God, that you serve the entire world, but you have a direct relationship with God, and God is your only sovereign. So we call Satguru Satguru, but we also call him Sache Pasha. And this started at the Guru Sahib's time as well. Sache Pasha, true emperor. So the emperors at that time were saying, if he's the Sache Pasha, then where does that leave me, right? Then am I the Chuta Pasha? And that's what Guru Nanak is actually saying. God, and remember what Satguru is, not a human, it's Shabd, it's Vaiguru. That you have a direct relationship with God as your sovereign and no one else. So when we look at the Guru's example, Manindra Singh talked about the different cities that each Guru established. They established cities that weren't just spiritual. They established business around it. They had political relations. You have Sri Hargobindpur. Sri Hargobind, Hargobindpur established by Cheme Pacha, Sri Guru Hargobind Sahib. It's still, if you go there today, it's got the bazaars designed the way Satguru designed them. It's got the gates that Satguru built. It's also got the masjid that Satguru built. So a mosque. It's got five mandars, small mandars designed for the Hindus. Why? Because it's a message for us that we have our beliefs, but we welcome everybody. We're not forcing anyone to believe anything. We believe what we believe because we believe it's right, but we're not forcing that down anyone's throat and we're open to everybody. It's a message for us that I think is so relevant today even. And the Khalsa, even the word Khalsa, literally means one that's directly governed by the king. It's a Persian word. I mean, most of us understand Khalsa as being pure. It's actually uh, another word that was used by the Mughal emperor to say land directly governed by the emperor. So that's what Khalsa was. And the Khalsa literally means directly governed by a Kalpuk. So as the Khalsa, we have, our, we have us, ourselves as an army, we have ourselves as a political uh, base at Sri Akal we have our Nishan Sahib, we have a sovereign culture. That's Gurmukhi, Gurmat Sangeet, a separate, separate everything. So we are a nation. And remember what I said yesterday about expanding Sikhi? from just uh, this understanding of it as a religion, because that's Dubda, that's not Bibek. Bibek is understanding Sikhi as a whole. I'm not just a Sikh at home, I'm not just Sikh religiously. I'm politically, socially, culturally a Sikh. That defines how I interact on all of those different levels. So like I said, this word Khalsa was actually first used by Guru Har Gobind Sahib. And if we look at our Fateh, it reflects exactly that, that the Khalsa is gods, Vaigurus, and that our victory is also Vaigurus. So when we are doing anything, if you have God on your side, then there's no doubt that you're doing it and you will re receive success for it. That you're not, you're not doing it for yourself, you're doing it in a larger mission. And that's what those ideals were about, right? About uplifting everybody, about making things better for everybody. Not just for six, but for everybody in this, in this world. And that's where that thinking comes, that I'm sure of my success, that I know that I'm doing this and God approves of this and that's why I will be successful. And so any obstacle that a Khalsa comes against doesn't matter. We will break through it because God's on our side. And if I 
have to break this body onto that obstacle, then that's okay. Because the body isn't who I am anyways, right? So how do you challenge this obstacle, which is the system? How do you challenge it? And the gurus have given us different examples. So Guru Nanak challenged it through his speech, through Shabd. Then you have dipl diplomacy and negotiations. And you, have, you see that through Guru Hargobind Sahib, you see that through Guru uh, Gobind Singh. You have relationships between Sache Pasha and the Mughal Pasha. How did they interact? And we don't have enough time to go through that in detail. But there were interactions. How did they interact? How did they negotiate those relationships? And then finally, an armed response. And quite rightly, we have and we retain the right to where no other, where no other means is going to be successful, we have a right to respond with an armed response. That's our right. And that's an inherent human right. So I'm gonna, I wanted to talk about this more later, but I think it might be appropriate now. This thought about nonviolence, exclusive nonviolence. I don't think any human being is bound by it. If someone's child is being pulled from in front of them, like Maninder Singh said yesterday, will they be nonviolent? No, of course not. You will defend yourself. So we accept the fact that a violent or an armed response to certain situations is inevitable. That if you say that no, no situation calls for it, you're just being blind. So Kal Saraj. We say every day, Raj Karega Kal Sa koi. What does that actually mean? It's about taking those values and putting them onto the earth and creating God's, creating Vaigru's intended rule here. That we are trying to take those divine values and we're trying to implement them for everybody here. And those principles are of compassion, equality, justice for everybody. And Guru Sahib showed us in those small towns, on those cities, how those can be implemented. And our goal as the Khalsa has always been to see that happen for everybody everywhere. So each Sikh starts with the thought that I'm going to create Khalsa Raj first within myself. If I can govern myself, Manjita Jagjit, right? If I can win myself, then I can win the world. So that battle starts inside. And then we move to our family to create these, these families which are based on these values. So I'm not in my family as a dictator. I'm not in my family as uh, a hegemon. I'm there as uh, someone that can pass these values on to my children, then to my community, then to my country, and then the entire world. It's about these circles that you create. But like I said already many times, there's no border to this. So to think of Kal Saraj as being just Punjab, or Kal Saraj being a certain geographic location, it's not what Kal Saraj was meant to be. Kal Saraj is everywhere. And yes, you have to start somewhere. But really, it's about creating everything in the form of what God had intended. So I don't have enough time to talk about Baba Banda Singh in a lot of depth. But uh, Baba Banda Singh was the first Sikh ruler, as it were, that was sent by Guru Gobind Singh. Now, he was sent with this particular system. So how would a Khalsa Raj look, right? And this is probably the most authentic model that we can come with. That he came with a group of the Panjpiyare who had a veto, as it were. That he is the leader, but he is under these five good Sikhs who have a veto over him, who can overrule him, and who guide him. What does he do? He's not there to take over territory. He's not there to conquer Punjab. He's going through Punjab and liberating these cities and creating a new system. So this client-patron relationship that existed for centuries, hundreds and hundreds of years, where these people were working the land and didn't have any sort of uh, fruits of the labor, who were essentially indentured, uh, indentured labor slaves, he's giving them the right to the land. He's freeing them. And what's happening? People are joining him. If you look at these quotes, these quotes are basically contemporary or slightly after. It's talking about the fact that you can have someone who's the lowest of the low 
he joins with Baba Banda Singh and in short time he would return to his birthplace as its ruler with his order of appointment in his hand. So he's taking these people that had no relationship with any sort of power and he's putting them in places of power. And he's giving liberty to Muslims and Hindus who are joining him. And on top of that, these people who they're ruling over, they're liking this Raj so much, they're liking this idea so much that they're themselves voluntarily becoming Sikhs. So that's our first idea, that it's about reforming the system. It's about revolutionizing the system, and that's what Baba Banda Singh tried to do in that short time that he was uh, active, in those eight years, essentially. Then you have 1716 onwards, after Baba Banda Singh Shahidi, you have the Sikhs who are a persecuted minority, and you have missiles. And you have these missiles who then eventually, I'm cutting through history really, really quickly, they develop these kingdoms, these small kingdoms. And you essentially have a return from this revolutionary idea. Slowly you're uh, heading back from that and going back to the same model that the Mughals had essentially, but making a little bit more benevolent. So the Sikh community at that point didn't press forward with this uh, revolutionary ideal of changing society. They started then focusing more on creating these territorial holdings. These missiles had different territorial holdings. So it's going back. And then you have Maharaj Aranjit Singh who completely abandons that idea of revolutionizing society and has, he was a good guy, no doubt. And we can learn a lot about uh, you know, how he ruled and with compassion and essentially it was a secular society. But he didn't revolutionize the way that rule was. He just adopted the Mughal system of king, emperor and uh, vassals underneath. And then you have the conflict with the British shortly after Maharajanjit Singh's death and the Khalsa, which was enjoying this rule for a small period, is now once again uh, a gulam, a slave of the British. And there's a famous poem called Jang Hind Punjabda. Um, and one of the most famous lines in it is, Ik Sarkar Bajo, Fauja Jitake Antanu Hariani that without proper leadership, the Fawjan, the army of the Khalsa, has snatched defeat from the uh, mouth of victory. That even though they could have won because they didn't have proper leadership, they were defeated. So where we started with Punjab, being the first Khalsa Raj, as it were, being our Des, you see that eroding. After 19, uh, in the lead up to, 1984, in, to 1947. You have Sikh institutions that are being changed. So Gurdwari, we look at Gurdwari today and they're dysfunctional. Like let's just face it, the Gurdwari and the way they're governed today is dysfunctional. Gurdwari are meant to be social, political, cultural hubs, right? They were supposed to be for the community. So how did it get to the way it is today? Just as an example, when the Khalsa was being persecuted, they had these people who were sympathetic to the Sikh cause, Mahants, who were not Khalsa themselves, administering these places. And they continued through Maharaja Ranjit Singh's time. So the British come and they bring their idea of property. And they look at this Gurdwara with the amount of land that's endowed to it by Maharaja Ranjit Singh and other, other Sikh rulers. And they say, you're the one that takes care of all this? And the Mahants, yes. Okay, so that means you're the owner, right? So it passes essential ownership rights of Gurdwari to people who weren't supposed to be the owners, and then they start collecting the wealth that's coming in, and that wealth corrupts them. They pass that on to their children, the children's children. So these people who are administering Gurdwari, who are owning Gurdwari, no longer have any link or sympathy for the Sikh cause. The only link they have with Sikhi is that they're getting money from Sikhs. Six now try and reclaim these Gurdwari. And what's the British problem with that? The British problem is that if this is private property, today you want to grab these Gurdwari, tomorrow who knows what you'll want to grab. So under what legal basis are you going to be taking these Gurdwari away from these Mahants? What, what's the legal precedent for it? 
the six have this wide scale agitation and they manage to convince the British that no, we, we will get it back and the British convince the Mahants to cede control. They get certain things in return for it. But the British ask, so how are you going to do it then? And this is the birth of the SGPC. And the SGPC is the first democratically elected body in Sikh history. So we now take a British system. So remember the Khalsa is supposed to be revolutionizing, supposed to create something new. First we adopted the Mughal system, and now with the British, the British, how are you going to govern your Gurdwara? We say, we'll do it through democracy, we'll do it through votes. So now you have Gurdwara up to this day being run through elections and votes. And we know that elections and votes are not the way a spiritual community is going to be run. Like the most spiritual person is not almost never the one who's going to get the most votes. Anyways, our institutions, whether that's Sarbat Kal, Sarkal, all that is being slowly eroded. And Sikh identity as a soft people is also an obstacle to this new mission of creating Indian nationalism. This vision of this united India, you have this stickling point of the Muslims on one side and the Sikhs also. And Gandhi, Mondas Karamchand Gandhi, also known as Mahatma Gandhi, there's some, a lot of quotes by this guy about what he thinks about, about Sikhs. So he says, today I'll only say that to me Sikhism is a part of Hinduism, but the situation is different from a legal point of view. Dr. Ambedkar wants a change of religion. So Dr. Ambedkar was the leader of the Dalits, and he wanted to take millions of Dalits and convert to Sikhi. Eventually, he converted to Buddhism. But in uh, his initial uh, thoughts, he wanted to become a Sikh. If becoming a Sikh amounts to conversion, then this kind of conversion on the part of Harijans is dangerous. If you can persuade the Sikhs to accept that Sikhism is, part, is a part of Hinduism, and if you can make them give up the se separate electorate, then I will have no objections to Harijans calling themselves Sikhs. So Gandhi is looking at this and he's saying, if you call yourselves Hindus and you give up your separate rights, then I don't care if Harijans become uh, Sikhs. But if you're going to expand your community as Sikhs with these millions of Harijans, so-called Harijans low caste, then I have a new problem. I have a new political power that I have to negotiate with and deal with. So I can't, I can't deal with that. And then another quote, I wish you would persuade enlightened Sikhs to take the Devanagari script in the place of Gurmukhi. So the Hindi script, that Gandhi is saying, why don't you just give up your Gurmukhi and use the Devanagari script, the Hindi script. Why? Because this Sikh identity, this sovereign Sikh identity is a big problem for Gandhi who's the father of this nation. He's trying to create one nationalism, one Hindustan, and you have these people who have a history and a culture and a faith that's based on sovereignty. So how are you going to negotiate that? 1947 to 1965, you have partition of Punjab. And the biggest problem Sikhs have had is people. We don't have enough people. So in Punjab, we were neglected because we weren't a majority in any area of Punjab. So Punjab is partitioned, more than half goes to Pakistan. About half of our population is on the wrong side of this border that's been arbitrarily created. I mean, if you, really it is sad. You can go to Dera Baba Nanak's border today and you can see Kartarpur across the border. You can see it. And it makes no sense that this is such an important Gurdwara, why is it on the other side of the border? You can go to a place called Dera Chahal. You can stand on the border there and you can see across the border this Gurdwara of Guru Hargobind Sahib with a still a Gumbad, you can see, see it from afar, and it's on the wrong side of the border. So Sikh leadership, the Sikh people were essentially sidelined when this line was created through their homeland. Not a partition of India, a, or a, it was a partition of Punjab. So what were Sikhs thinking at this time? We still maintained an, ident an identity from the Muslims. We said, we're not Muslims, we're not going to be going with Pakistan. We refuse to be governed by uh, the Muslims. Fair enough. But when it came to the Hindu community, and here, what does Hindu really mean, right? I mean, scholars on Hinduism uh, will recognize that it's such a diverse term. It can include almost anything, right? 
but they don't have that same view of Hindus. They say, no mas darishtaya, that we have a relationship with Hindus, so we'll go with the Hindus. So we, as Sikhs, have on many times in our history, and even now, felt that we aren't Hindus, but we have a special relationship with Hindus. Probably because our ancestors, in large part, came from that community. That's an unrequited feeling. The way we, as a community, have often looked at the majority Hindu community, the Indian community uh, largely, has not been the way that community has looked at us. We have these values of inclusion, these ideas that are essentially revolutionary, and we've stopped taking them as being as unique as they really are. We look at others and we judge them from our paradigm, that everyone is equal, everyone is entitled to dignity. And we expect that people look at us the same way when it's not true. For example, and some people will get really offended when I say this, we often say, you'll hear Sikhs saying, all religions are equal. Sounds good, but that doesn't make any logical sense. All religions aren't equal. All ideologies, all thoughts are not equal. All people are equal. All people are entitled to human rights, the same respect and dignity, but not all ideologies should be looked on as being equal and benign. Some ideologies are not. Anyways, this is a lecture in of itself. So this new Indian nationalism called Bharat Mata, Mother India, it's born, and Sikhs are accepted if they accept that they are Hindus and they accept the Hindu culture. Because what is Hinduism, right? It's largely a culture. It's different cultures. So if you include yourself in this and you say that you are a part of this mass, then you can carve yourself a certain section. And you know, we can, uh, you even see this now. You can accept Guru Nanak as being an avatar of Vishnu if you want. You can have an idol of Guru Nanak in the mandir if you want. But if you say that you are a sovereign people, then this is a problem for us as an Indian nationalist cause. So anything that these uh, six, this minority is saying to separate themselves or ask for something, then that is a problem and then you are going to be treated as anti-national, as treasonous. So Muslims have always been considered anti-national, and now Sikhs are thrown under the same label as anti-national whenever they want to ask for something. Linguistic re re reorganization of the states happens in India. So based on language, different states are made. Punjab is ignored. Why? Because creating a Punjab state based on Punjabi as a language will create a place in India where Sikhs are a majority. And this isn't acceptable. So Sikhs are treated in a, in a way that's different than all others. Massive agitation happens, Punjabi Subha is formed, kind of as a reward actually for six helping in the 1965 uh, India-Pakistan war. Because they proved there, right, that we'll help India. So as a reward, India says, okay, we'll give you your Punjabi Subha, it's not going to be what you wanted, we're going to cut large por portions of it off, it's going to be a crippled state, but we'll give it to you. So for the first time you have a Punjab with a Sikh majority, even though it's cut in a way that's not practical, it's got these uh, problems in terms of shared water, in terms of a shared capital, but India gives it to you for your having uh, helped in 1965. There's this anti-Sikh psyche, and how is that reflect reflected? You see it in the mainstream often with degrading sort of jokes or characters about Sikhs. As a minority, Sikhs are seeing as being too demanding that they're not doing so poorly. You have these Dalits, you have these uh, southern Indians who are facing famine. They're not complaining. What, what's wrong with these guys? They're so affluent and they're trying to create problems. And once again, Sikhs are seen as an obstacle to national unity. And Sikhs as a community were and are still completely ignorant to this feeling in the mainstream. Kind of like how the Jews in Europe prior to the Holocaust, thought we are Europeans, we are Germans, we are, you know, we have a different religion, but we are part of this, uh, this country. And when the Nazis came, it was a rude awakening for them. We still haven't woken up. Recently, just a couple weeks ago, you had this Gurmeher Kaur. Gurmeher Kaur 
uh, is from a Sikh background. She's not uh, particularly religious. She, her name is a Sikh name. Her father was an, an Indian soldier who died in Kargil, which was a, essentially a war between India and Pakistan on a mountain in 1999. He was also not a, a, a practicing, practicing Sikh as we would understand it. He was a Munna. The, her grandfather wears a Dastar. So the only thing identifying her as a Sikh is her name. And she does this video in which she says, war killed my father, not Pakistan. What's wrong with that? Like, she's just trying to show that I don't hate Pakistan, even though my father was killed in a war with Pakistan. You know, in any other place, that would be looked upon as you know, positive. That's, she's showing you know, she doesn't hate. The Indian media, prominent stars, cricket stars, they jump on this. And that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. That, oh, a cricket star says, my bat hit so many wickets, it wasn't me. I mean, and then you have these politicians who are making fun of her sick faith, who are insulting her. Then you have so many people who are even going so far as to say that she should be raped because of making this comment. And it's really focusing on her sick identity, that she was, she's just being stupid. You've never seen this... Uh, you wouldn't see the same sort of hatred towards her community if it was a Hindu. So Indra Gandhi. Indra Gandhi is this character that comes in uh, after, after 1947, and then after her father, Jawaharlal Nehru, dies, she slowly is elevated to become the Prime Minister of India. We look at Indra Gandhi as a witch, as a villain. But we have to understand who she was and what was going through her mind, right? She was a woman surrounded by old men who have a lot of political experience, who are her father's age, she's feeling vulnerable. She's feeling that, do I really deserve to be here? So what does she do? She tries to go out there, she tries to overcompensate in a way. And after the 1971 war with Pakistan, where she defeats Pakistan, Bangladesh is created, she's elevated to the status of Durga Mata, the warrior goddess the goddess of war. After this, she's looked upon as being more than just a political leader. She surrounds herself with syncophants, people who suck up to her, who won't tell her the truth. She becomes essentially a dictator who thinks that she can run India however she wants. She declares an emergency when her government is about to fall. And these six in Punjab are one of the only groups who massively oppose her emergency. So she declared an emergency across India to essentially stop her government from falling. And six protests, 40,000 six. And they are using Amritsar as the center of this agitation. So Siri Darbar Sahib, these groups are leaving from Siri Darbar Sahib and protesting her emergency. She takes this personally. She's not used to anyone opposing her anymore. She can't take that. So she sees six already from that paradigm that these guys are anti-national, they're not exactly Indians, and she says, for sure now, these guys aren't Indians, they're a problem. And she decides to use six as a pawn in her political game. So she won her next election after the Bangladesh war, huge victory, because she was Durga Mata, she had this uh, military victory. <coughs> now she's going to use the six in a similar exercise in the lead up to the 1984 election because she's coming for re-election in 1984. So it's a very long story about what she does. Akal Takht is a sixth center. Like agita agitations are happening from there. She tries to create divisions. She tries to support one group of six against another group of six. She's trying to play po politics within the Sikh community as best as she can. And she creates groups like, for example, the Nirankaris, who originally were largely from a Sikh background and became a, a cult that tried to ins uh, basically insult who six were. They said, you have your Panch Piyari, we'll create a Sat Sitare. You have your Vasakhi on the same day, we're going to have our convention in Amritsar. So just to provoke six, to create these conflicts, create these fissures for her own political success. 1973 Anandpur Sahib Resolution. This document became the focus of Indira Gandhi's and the Indian state's problem with the six, that they've declared that they want these rights. And some of them said this is a declaration of independence from India. But if you look at the document, 
there's no request or demand for a separate six state in it. What is, what is this document calling for? It says greater federalism that respects diversity. Chandigarh to Punjab, merge Punjabi areas to Punjab, fair division of the waters in Ravi Bias, end employment, assist, la assist the labor class, dignity of labor, um, uplift the poor and depressed sections of society, stop the exploitation by capitalism, and a special ministry for low caste to uplift them. None of this is inherently wrong. None of this is uh, separatist. It reflects Sikh values, right? It's the Sikh psyche, even though we've changed a lot since when we were rulers, it's still focused on Guru Granth Sahib, it's still focused on those values that we've gotten. And this Anandpur Sahib res resolution reflected those values. But it's declared anti-national, that this is unacceptable. So when their demands aren't met, the Sikhs start an agitation. So groups go and mass arrests happen, and it's a protest of why isn't India giving us these demands. 250,000 Sikhs court arrest. 250,000 are filling the jails. 256 are killed in fake encounters. Fake encounters that we saw through the 80s and 90s, they started here. So you have these particularly problematic Sikh leaders, just kill them. The courts won't do anything, so you say that they were caught in an encounter between the police, you shoot them. Problem solved. And Indira Gandhi is now looking forward to this conflict towards the 1984 uh, election. She's building it up as best as she can so that it explodes in 1984 and she can be once again the victor and gets uh, the masses votes. Vilification of six in the media. Indira Gandhi couldn't have orchestrated this if the mass didn't have some sort of sympathy for it. So the mass, the regular Indian community as it were, has some sort of sympathy towards this negative view of six. And then the media jumps onto this bandwagon. I can give you a list of quotes that are inflammatory, but these are just two quotes from still today mainstream Indian newspapers. So Girilal Jain was, I believe, uh, the editor of the Times of India. And he writes, to be candid, I do not have much sympathy for the Akali agitation, which has gone on and on in the process of acquired extremist something, violent and openly communal overtones. I sincerely believe that the agitation is misconceived because Sikhs cannot, in my opinion, have any genuine grievances. Sikhs cannot have any genuine grievances, the editor of the largest newspaper in India is saying. He's publishing this, that these guys are just, they're just agitators. Hindustan Times, April 4th, 1984. Get the killers. The extremists have taken over the bogus agitation. It's imperative that forces of law and order make their presence felt. They, the Akalis, are deliber de deliberately making the whole thing communal, just as Muslim League did in pre-partition India. So they're raising this, that the Muslim League, they created partition. These six are going to create partition again. The masses are getting agitated. And then, once again, I'm sorry I don't have time to go into all the details because there's so much here. Sanjay Nal Singh, at first, was a religious leader, leader of the Damnuri Taksal. So who is Sanjay Nal Singh? A short uh, anecdote from his life, after Sant Kartar Singh, his predecessor, passed away, there was a discussion that who should lead the Damnuri Taksal. And a lot of the students, the educated students, university students, they said, make by Amrik Singh, who is Sant Kartar Singh's son, the next leader, because he's educated, he's a master's, he's a university student, that he should become the next leader. But they made Sant Janal Singh the next leader. And he was known for being completely immersed in Barney, that he didn't speak much. And these students, they say that we went to hear his first speech, just to see what this guy actually says, that he's probably going to make a fool of himself, so let's go hear what he says. It's the Barsi, or the Pog of Sant Kartar Singh, his funeral service as it were. And Prakash Singh Badal, who just, just defeated a couple days ago, he stands up as the leader of the Akalis and he says, I offer the Damnuri Taksal today, if there's anything you, you need, that I'll give it to you. And you've probably seen, uh, some of you have probably seen this in the movie, but Sant Janal Singh got up right after, and he makes this impassioned speech very on point, and he ends and he says that, you know, we were created by Guru Gobind Singh, 
and that we're not in the habit of asking for anything. So I would say to the Akalis and the Punjab government, if you need anything from us, we'll give it to you today. And everyone's amazed that this guy who was exclusively religious, that he has this political sense to actually answer. So he does this mass grassroots parchar. He's connecting with the grassroots. And he's building this collective of Amrataris. And when a reporter asks him, so do you have any bombs? Like, are you creating this revolution? Because, you know, you're creating all these Amrataris, you, you have this agitation, you have all these demands. Do you have any bombs? He says, yeah, I have a lot of bombs. He said, what, what, what kind of bombs? And he says, every Amritari I'm making is a bomb. Every Amritari I'm making is going to be an explosion for your system. So the Sikhs look at him, he's trusted, he's respected. And Indira Gandhi, so this is the part where some people say that Indira Gandhi created Sanjanal Singh. It's not true. Sanjanal Singh was a leader, but that having been said, Indira Gandhi did try and play off the Akali leadership on one hand and Sanjanal Singh on the other, trying to create this fissure where there would be a polar opposite between the Sikh community and the Akalis would lose uh, some of their uh, support base. So she did try and play it off, but to suggest that Sanjanal Singh was a creation of her, it's ridiculous. So let's understand the place of Darbar Sahib. Darbar Sahib is more than a Mecca, it's more than a Vatican. Our history is connected with it inherently. So whether you look at the history of the Gurus, or by Mani Singh, or by Sukha Singh Mahatab Singh, or by or Baba Deep Singh, all of our history is connected with Darbar Sahib. When you go to a Sikh's home, one of the almost inevitable things you'll come across is a picture of Darbar Sahib on the wall. Every day we ask for Sri Amr Sahib Ji Ki Darshan Ishnan. It's a part of our psyche, that Amritsar is our center. It's our political center, it's our cultural center, it's our religious center. It's where all of our agitations start from. And rulers have in the past destroyed Sri Darbar Sahib on many occasions. The Afghans recognized the importance of Darbar Sahib and they destroyed it. So Abdali asked, where did these Sikhs get their power from? And the answer was that these guys, even if they're defeated, they go and they do Ishnan in the Sarovar there and they come out with this spirit and they go back to fighting again. And he says, then what I'll do is I'll destroy this place. So he doesn't destroy it once, he destroys it in 1957, Six build it again, he destroys it in 1962, he blows it up with cannons. Six build it again, in, in 1764 he destroys it again. And you have these stories of the Singhs who were inside the Darbar Sahib, who fought inside the Darbar Sahib and when the Darbar Sahib was blown up, they, I believe a group of ten of them were initially blown up inside the Darbar Sahib. You have Baba Gurbak Singh, who with just 30 of his Singhs fought this amazing battle in front of Akal Takht, in front of Akal Takht to fight off the Afghan invaders, and they died to a man. And you had Qazi Noor Muhammad, who was an observer, and he writes that they fought with so much passion that he who calls six dogs, he even has words of praise for this battle, that I've never seen anything like this before. Sikhs are always drawn back. Sikhs are always drawn back to Darbar Sahib and Amritsar that this is ours and we will reclaim it. So June 1984, there's a whole build-up. Sanjay Nail Singh is located inside the Darbar Sahib complex along with different Sikh groups. And in the build-up, they create this situation where Indira Gandhi in June 1984 sends the army in. There's no charges against Sanjanal Singh. There's no criminal case. What should have been a fairly simple operation to extract someone from this complex if they really wanted to, turns into this massacre in which a large portion of Sri Darbar Sahib's complex is destroyed. Sri Akal Takh Sahib is destroyed. The symbol of Sikh sovereignty is blown up. It's a symbolic gesture to show that this where you were agitating from we will destroy it it's the same thing the afghans did and joyce pedigree says the army went into the darbar sahib not to eliminate a political figure or a political movement to, to, to suppress the culture of a people to attack their heart to strike a blow at their at their spirit and self-confidence um, ram narayan kumar who's done a lot of research he's passed away now 
but he says the Operation Blue Star was not only envisioned and rehearsed in advance, meticulously and in total secrecy, it was also aimed at obtaining mass maximum number of sick victims, largely devout pilgrims, unconnected with the political agitations. The facts should speak for themselves. And most of us know that this happened during Guru Arjan Dev Ji's Shahidi Gurpur, when it's filled. It's happening in June, when it's the hottest month. You have General S.K. Sinha, who says in 1984 and has said up to, this, uh, up to the present day that the rehearsals for Darbar Sahib started in 1982 with a model of Darbar Sahib. So Indira Gandhi was building up towards it. This was her stunt in a way to win political support. And the, she was able to do it because that psyche was there, that six are agitators, six need to be crushed, that these are unreasonable demands, these guys are separatists. And then you have these... I would say that they were inspirational to the Sikhs, that you, we talk about you know, Sikh history. You have this other example of Sikhs who then defended Sayyid Darbar Sahib with an armed response, and they held off the army for 60 hours, that the army didn't expect that amount of resistance. And you have a Dalit, uh, a Dalit writer, who, A.R. Darshi, who says, the six fought gallantly and demonstrated their remarkable valor, courage, and fighting skill. So even the army respected this response. These are pictures that were smuggled out of the Sahib. Uh, there's different stories about how these pictures were taken. One is that when they were being developed, uh, they were, uh, a copy was taken at that time. I don't know exactly what the story is. But six were shot. Sikh pilgrims, Shraddha Alu, who were there, Yatri, they were shot dead. There was mass atrocities. There was a genuine, genuine hatred for Sikhs by the army that was only made worse by the fact that the Sikhs had killed so many of their colleagues. What happened after? So you have this operation, the Bar Saab is in ruins, flames, Akal Takht is destroyed. The physical building is destroyed. Now, how do you destroy the idea behind it? How do you destroy the idea behind this sovereignty? <coughs> they took the Jathidar of Akal Takht, his name was Jathidar Kirpal Singh, and they have him read a statement. That's the picture of the statement, in which he says, Kota Saab, which is the area in uh, Akal Takht Saab where Sukhasan happens, Kota Saab is fine, that everything is fine. And this propaganda video, it focuses just on the Pira Saab there where the Sukhasan happens just focuses on the Rumale there. And he's saying, Kota Saab is fine. And everyone knows this is a complete lie. And the Jathidar of Akal Takht, who was once Akali Fulla Singh, who were these revolutionary leaders, he's like uh, in Punjabi, Pijibili. he's standing there and he's reading lies off a piece of paper. <coughs> so who are Sikhs supposed to trust? Sanjanal Singh, he's not there anymore. And then they create this, I mean, I'm, probably going to offend someone, I'm sure. This rumor that he's still alive and there's no replacement for him because you're still waiting for him to come back. You have the Akal Takht Jathedar, who's supposed to be the leader of the Sikh Panth, reading these lies from a piece of paper. And then you have these visits. You have Zail Singh, Indra Gandhi, army generals who are walking into Darbar Sahib, looking around. And then you have the head Granthi of Darbar Sahib, who was once Baba Buddha Ji, who are these, once again, spiritual good Sikhs. You have Saab Singh walking beside Indra Gandhi, you know, talking to her. Maybe he was saying, you know, this is really bad. I'm not saying that he was saying, you know, good job. But as a spiritual leader, you would think that he would not say anything to her. That if you are an occupying force, that I will not speak to you. That I will do my duty in terms of Seva Guru Gansa, but I'm not going to walk with you and talk with you. Then you have pictures and videos who are sent all across the world, even to Canada, mailed out randomly to any sick name they found in a phone book. And Sikhs are playing these in their VCRs and they're seeing these pictures. And it's, you know, what, what's going on? So then Sarbat Khalsa, which is supposed to be our parliament, the government arranges for that to be called. The Sarbat Khalsa is called by Nihang Santa Singh. Then they use Indian laborers and they rebuild Akal Takht. So this Akal Takht that was first built by Pai Gurdas, Baba Buddha, that was rebuilt by the Sikhs after every invasion. You have the invader, 
who's now going to rebuild it for you. The invader is going to come and build it for you and say, here, you can have it back. How is a sick psyche going to accept this? Maybe they thought the sick psyche would accept it, that they've been crushed now. But this only inflamed those sentiments. So the occupation of Sri Darbar Sahib lasted for several months. And Sikhs would go, and they would go for periods in the day, but it wasn't open. And there's a picture of when it finally was opened, of Sikhs running in the streets. Running in the streets to go back, to have darshan. This was followed by Operation Woodrose, in which Amritari youth in the pens were picked up, tortured, killed. It was a systematic attempt at crushing that spirit of resistance and creating a military victory for Indira Gandhi at the same time. So Indira Gandhi is assassinated by Pai Sutwan Singh and Pai Bhyan Singh. I don't have time to go into how that happened, but you see these mass killings of Sikhs across India. Here's an interesting quote. We talk about you know, Argentina, uh, Chile, and all these places where killings have taken place. And Barbara Crossett, she makes this uh, observation. Almost as many Sikhs died in a few days in India in 1984 than all the deaths and disappearances in Chile during the 17-year military rule of uh, General Augusto Pinochet. So Pinochet is recognized as a villain, that this person has killed so many people. In three days, more Sikhs were killed in India than in that 17 years. The world doesn't know about it. The Nanavati Commission, which was essentially a useless commission, didn't result in anything. They recognized that ba but for the backing and help of influential and resor resourceful persons, killings of Sikhs so swi swiftly and in large numbers could not have happened. That these weren't just mass uprisings of people who decided to kill Sikhs. Something was organizing it. It was the Congress, Congress party, Congress government that facilitated the mass killings of Sikhs. How were Sikhs killed? As a community, I don't think we've even focused on this as much. Have you ever heard of anyone being murdered with a tire? Forget, you know, thousands of people being murdered with tires. Even one or two people. How, when was the last time you heard of a person being wrapped in a tire and being lit on fire? Never before, never after. So where did this mode of killing come from? Who came up with this idea? Sanjay Suri, who's a reporter, he's written a book. He says, tires, as a murder weapon, let's talk tires. This method of killing was gut-wrenchingly unusual. Everywhere, large numbers of Sikhs were ringed with burning tires. In years of reporting crime, I'd never seen such a method of killing in Delhi. Never before, never since. Over those three days, this became the chosen way to kill all over the city. How did this suddenly, suddenly happen? And he notes that the police, who are doing nothing to help these Sikhs who are being burnt alive, are guarding the tire market. They're at the tire market. Why? Because they're set, handing tires out. Kerosene, which is being used to light the fires, where's the kerosene coming? Kerosene is rationed. It's coming from the government. These people who are attacking six with lists, where are these lists coming from? Either the municipal corporation has them, utilities have them, or there's voter lists. Voter lists. So these gangs, these mobs, are being handed voter lists, and they're being told where the six live. So you have government organization at the top, but the masses underneath, they're just the people. And they have this grievance that Sikhs deserve a punishment. Even after, the media, society, they don't recognize the atrocity that's happened. They recognize Indira Gandhi's death. They don't recognize what happened to the Sikh community as being an atrocity. There's still today no government memorial to those killed in November 1984. No memorial at all. The Sikhs have created one recently. But the government doesn't recognize it. And in fact, people were commenting that Sikhs deserved it. They brought this on themselves. Rajiv Gandhi justified the killings as being a large tree. And when a large tree falls, the earth, shatter, the earth shakes a bit. And what happens? Just as Indira Gandhi predicted, unfortunately, she didn't predict that she wouldn't be alive to see it. Massive Congress victory. 404 seats out of 533. Massive victory. The Indian people reward this action with votes. And the perpetrators who orchestrated these killings, Rajiv Gandhi makes them cabinet ministers. Armed conflict. I can't go into any depth here. I'm going to have to move really quickly. 
But people ask me, how can you justify what was essentially a terrorist extremist movement? My answer is this. Your family is being picked up, disappeared. You go to the police, the police want to arrest you. The government's not helping, the government is encouraging this. The society, civil society, media, no one is on your side. What option do you have besides picking up a gun and defending yourself? Who wouldn't understand that? That was the situation. There was no police. There was no civil society protection. There was no media. There was no government that was protecting or trying to stand up for the six at that time. So the six did, this group of six did what they could do. They grabbed whatever weapons they had, they did what they could, and they resisted. There's different uh, highs and lows in this movement, but essentially you have the security forces who are a colonial force. They've never been reformed after the British left, and they suppress this group. You first have Julio Ribeiro, who's a South Indian, and he is very oppressive, but he still has some limits. He recognizes some limits. They get rid of him, they replace him with KPS Gill. KPS Gill says, do whatever you need to do, just crush this. So the families are picked up, bounties are placed. You have an atmosphere of absolute terror where people aren't able to speak freely, think freely, act freely. And you have paramilitary forces everywhere. And Punjab being a plane, there's nowhere to hide. So this movement is crushed in very short order between 1992 and 1993 with essentially mass killings. Chief Minister Bhant Singh is the one who oversaw it. He's blown up in 1995 uh, with a suicide bombing. Uh, and then the final killing of this movement is Jaswant Singh Kalada. Jaswant Singh Kalada is a bank employee trained as a lawyer. He's going to cremation grounds and he's finding lists of people who have been illegally cremated and he estimates at least 25,000. He comes to Canada, tells the story. In Canada they tell him don't go back and he's warned that you found 25,000 disappearances, what about 25,001? He goes back anyways and in the days after Chief Minister Bhant Singh's uh, assassination, he's picked up, held for 40 days. 40 days in custody, interviewed by the likes of KPS Gill himself. And finally, after torture, he's killed. But after that, that same level of killings stopped. What happened after this period? You have a marginalization and shaming of Khalsa identity. Oh, Babio, I've seen this myself. In 1994, I remember my cousin, it was actually Jigmeet Singh, NDP, um, he shot Tamrat. He was wearing his gatra over top, and we were both in the back of a car. We were going to Damdam Asab, and there was a police checkpoint. And he had an orange keski and a blue dastar. And the police checkpoint, I remember they talked to him. I don't know if he remembers, but I remember. They were talking down to him. They were making fun of him. So Amrathari identity was marginalized, was belittled, as being you guys are the ones that we just defeated. Then you start this Akhara culture, Punjabi culture. Singing and dancing have always been there in Punjabi culture, but this government-sponsored Akhara culture was something different. This is an article from uh, India Today. It's boom time, folks. The gun gives way to the tambourine in Punjab. So you have these people that are traumatized, that have been oppressed. What's the best thing you can do for them? Circuses, bread and circuses, right? You create these uh, mele for them. Take their mind off of it. Take their mind off Tarim anyways. Help them forget why they actually started this agitation, which is about greater rights for Dalits, for stopping the exploitation of the lower classes. Forget about that. Go watch some singing and dancing. And you have KPS Gill there uh, playing the chimta, having a nice time. And like I said, I don't have time for a greater a greater uh, exploration of these issues, but let's just look at, a, uh, look at what our problems are right now, what our needs are. Our institutions need reviving. Now we talk about Khalistan, and some people are going to get upset at me for this too. What does Khalistan mean? How do you jive Khalsa Raj with Khalistan? 
Like I've had people come to me very angrily. Khalistan de haq cha ha ya na? And my answer is Khalistan tu si ki soch rahe ki ya Khalistan. What is Khalistan to you? Is it Khalsa Raj? Okay. Obviously we all stand for Khalsa Raj. But if it's just another country, Pakistan, Hindustan, Khalistan, then what are we contributing? Right? We have to have an idea of how we want to transform society. Baba Banda Singh was, ab- was able to transform his society because he had a vision that people bought into. When you even have an election, if you have an election pl- platform, people will support your election platform because they believe in that vision. If you don't have a vision, you just have this general concept, it's hard for people to jump on board. So we have to understand what governance model as Khalsa we are going to offer the world that forwards that Sikh revolution, that turns everything on its head and creates that hukum and raj of a on this earth. How do we do that? Deravad. Deravad is nothing new. And you're seeing from time to time Deravad being like uh, cults. Cults that insult and uh, sort of marginalize, make fun of Sikhs. They're nothing new. But from time to time, you'll see, what do we do? And in some circumstances, members of these, leaders of these data have been shot dead. What does that accomplish? And what can we learn from the Guru's example? When Guru Tegh Bahadur became Guru, there were 22 people claiming to be Guru. Darbar Sahib was under the control of an alternate cult, of an alternate sect. Prithi Chand, who was after Guru Arjan, who was the brother of Guru Arjan, he created his own sect after Guru Hargobind. They didn't let Guru Tegh Bahadur into Darbar Sahib when he went to go there. Guru Gobind Singh, he could have sent his army, right? Crushed all these cults, crushed them. He didn't do any of that. When, when Guru Tegh Bahadur is attacked by one of these cults, shot in the arm, Lakisha Vanjara goes to this data and he takes, uh, it's Tirmal. Tirmal was uh, in the Guru's family. He was the brother of Guru Harai. He has the original Kartarpuri bead. So Lakhi Shah Manjara takes the Kartarpuri bead, ties up Tirmal and his followers, and brings them all in front of Guru Tegh Bahadur. And Guru Tegh Bahadur says, let them go. But they shot you. They attacked you. Let them go. And then the Kartarpuri bead, we should keep this, right? I mean, you're the rightful heir of, the, heir of this. So no, give it back. Not like this. What does he do? The Sikh gurus created something different than these dere. They created a separate movement. So these dere, they were saying, we focus on spirituality exclusively. And the gurus were saying, we do spirituality, but we do social as well. So bring in these low castes, make them a part of the Sikh army, uplift them, give people jobs. And slowly, slowly, through the time of Guru Gobind Singh, the numbers of Sikhs on this side are increasing and these cults are dwindling. Eventually, the people of Amritsar write Guru Gobind Singh saying that we want you to come take over Siddhi Darbar Sahib, rightfully. They invite him. And finally, he, by Mani Singh is sent as someone to go there. These people, Prithi Chand's cult, they abandoned Darbar Sahib. There was no military crushing of these cults. It was presenting something better to society. Why are these cults fl- flourishing? It's essentially a caste issue. My father went to his pind and he went to do an account part. So he goes to the Gurdwara and he says, how much for the account part? And they tell him the price. And there's this uh, so-called lower caste woman doing chadu. And he says, how can anyone afford that? And the lower caste woman says, only you people from outside can afford it. We can't afford it. So these cults, they're offering these people religion. They're offering them dignity where the Gurdwara are charging them a price for it. Our institutions are failing. And simply eliminating these cult leaders won't accomplish anything. We fix ourselves, and then we can fix the problem. Economic turmoil in Punjab, we have an an agricultural-based society, and agriculture is failing. You have to create industry. You have to create jobs. Creating Panthic leadership. Our leadership has failed us at every single level. And And why is that? It's because there's no inner connection. Our leaders are politicians just like politicians. Maybe even worse. Unless we're guided by that sick spirituality coming from inside us, we can't have anything different. So those leaders, like Sanjay Nelson, who had it inside, 
they can bring it outside and make a change. True assessment and selection of appropriate means of resistance. So what I'm trying to say here is, resistance doesn't always mean taking up a gun and shooting uh, who you think is your oppressor. It means finding the most appropriate way of changing the situation. Guru Gobind Singh, four sons are killed, father is killed, mother is killed. By who? Aurangzeb. What does Guru Gobind Singh do? No longer has Anandpur Sahib. He doesn't say, let's gather, gather an army and start a guerrilla uh, warfare against Aurangzeb. He writes a letter to Aurangzeb. And the, he starts off by listing Aurangzeb's atrocities, saying you're a tyrant, you're a liar. But at the end of Zafar Nama, what does he write? He says, let's meet. Let's have a discussion. Aurangzeb agrees to this. He dies before that can happen. But Guru Gobind Singh then has this discussion, this dialogue with Bahadur Shah, who is the successor. Jahangir is the one in his memoir, he writes that I eliminated, I executed Guru Arjan because uh, these mistaken Hindus and even Muslims are becoming his Sikhs. Guru Hargobind is imprisoned by Jahangir. But even despite these things, there's still a dialogue between Jahangir and Guru Hargobind. They still meet, they still have discussions. Guru Hargobind is still recorded as having saved Jahangir's life on a tiger attack. After all this, which is not to say we should be subservient, we should get rid of our dignity, which is to say we have to look at our examples and choose the right way of approaching and be guided by our Siddhant, by Gurmat. There's no easy solution to any of these. It starts from within us, starts from bringing Sikhi within us, then to our families, then to our communities. But it starts with Sikhi. Sikh Panth will be saved by Sikhi. It's simple, but it's the truth. All right, I'm going to stop here. Okay, I'll go on. Here in Canada, the effects of what happens in Punjab affect us here. After the 1985 Air India bombing, Sikhs were seen as villains. Sikhs were seen as being terrorists. The Sikh image was damaged very, very severely. And repeatedly, when Sikhs have agitated or asked for basic accountability from the Indian state here in Canada, that has been labeled as extremism by the Indian state, and that's been used to muzzle Sikhs, along with other things. Like still to this day, you will have Sikhs who are afraid of speaking their minds because they're afraid they won't get a visa. They're afraid of being blacklisted. It's legitimate, but we're always afraid. And this fear is used against us. So in 2012, I can go even further back, but this is kind of contemporary. 2012, John Baird goes to India, and every time a Canadian politician goes to India, they ask him the same question. So what are you going to do about Sikh extremism? And these politicians don't know what they're talking about. Like, they don't know what to say. So they just make some generic comment. Well, you know, if they're radicals and extremists, then we'll, you know, do whatever we can to combat that. And you have then headlines in India. That minister says that Khalistan uh, activists will be deported or they will be controlled, something. The NDP under Tom Mulcair, they do a statement for 1984. They recognize that there was this mass killing in 1984, Tom Mulcair. And the Indian ambassador, he criticizes that. Indian envoy decries Mulcair's misleading Golden Temple remarks. And you have Tarek Fatah, who's essentially an idiot. I mean, I have nothing good to say about the person. He says, Mulcair needs a lesson on India. And he, I'm sure, is the person to give it. So once again, Harper then goes in November 2012. But before that, I'll tell you that um, six members of my organization, we'd met with members of the Conservative Caucus, and we'd explained the situation. And there were members of the Conservative Caucus uh, who were of Sikh background who helped uh, explain the situation. And when this question of Sikh extremism rose again, Indian politicians expressed concern to Stephen Harper about Sikh extremism. Something different happened. Stephen Harper pushes back on Indians' warnings on Sikh extremism. In Canada, you don't call political speech extremism. You call it opposition. You can call it uh, whatever you want, but it's not extremism. So Harper actually says that he won't interfere with political speech, that if someone's being violent, then that's one thing. 
but political speech is completely different. Peaceful Khalistan protests will not lead to deportation. Like, how is this even a headline? Like, how could peaceful deportations, like, why would you think it could lead to deportations? Right, this is an Indian headline. So education makes a difference. Being able to express our struggle, our experience, makes a difference. And we have to do that. We have to be able to explain the sick struggle, the sick situation, in a way that people can understand. And that's not because we're being subservient. It's because when you have any struggle, you need allies. You need to explain yourself. So in this last election, you have 19 sick MPs. And in India, they don't know what to make of this. So four Indian origin Canadians sworn, as, sworn in as cabinet ministers. They're actually six, right? But they have trouble accepting that these are four Sikh cabinet ministers. In a first, two six among four Indian cabinet uh, Canadians sworn in as ministers. Uh, and then two six from four Indian Canadians sworn in as ministers. That's another headline. So they don't even understand that there's four six who are in cabinet. This disturbs them. And then there's these stories about how maybe they have some links with Khalistan. The rise of six is very, very uh, disturbing to some in the Indian, very disturbing to the Indian psyche. But what does that mean? It means that what we do here has an effect in India, has an effect in Punjab. Our success here has an impact on what happens in Punjab. And just finally, where we are today as a community in Canada, these are cartoons, and I know some people might find this uh, offensive, why are you showing this? But this is from the Montreal Gazette. Uh, this uh, cartoon artist, he still, he does cartoons for the Montreal Gazette even today. In 1984, you have a picture of an angry monkey, radical sick, don't feed. And then you have, uh, in 1986, uh, a picture of a Singh in Barna, Khalistan, Let's see, Khalistan, animal, vegetable, or mineral. Essentially saying, we don't know what you're talking about. We have no idea what you're talking about. And what are you coming off as, as an angry monkey? That having been said, let's be fair. When Darbar Sahib is attacked, your families are killed, if you come off as angry, then you know, there's a good reason for it. That having been said, it's been a long journey to explain what happened, and still we have to continue with our explanation of what happened, why uh, this oppression has always taken place, and kind of this discussion that we're having today, we have to internalize it, think more about it, and think how do we explain ourselves. And explaining yourself is not wrong. It's not subservient. It's just the way the world works. It's diplomacy. We need allies, we need to explain our mission, we need to explain our cause. And we as six here, we're best placed uh, to do that as young six in universities, high schools. So a lot of responsibility lies with us as well. That's all I have to say. Bye, Guruji Ka Khalsa. Bye, Guruji Ka